everyone and welcome to the Squiggly Careers podcast. I'm Sarah and I'm joined by my co-host Helen. Hello everybody. And this is episode 71 of our Squiggly Careers podcast, which is focused all about the ins and outs of how to develop the skills to succeed, whatever success means to you in a squiggly career, whether that's interview skills, discovering your values, or asking for a pay rise, managing stress at work, all things that I think we all have to do at some point in our careers these days. And some of them are more fun than others, but we will help you with all of it regardless. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, today's not a super fun topic, is it? But we'll come on I to know, that in a minute. I know. We'll, uh, we'll get the big reveal on the topic in a second. But before we do that, just a quick thank you to everybody who entered our competition on Instagram to win a copy of Emma Rosen's book, The Radical Sabbatical, which was in episode 70. That was a topic of episode 70's podcast. We did a competition for people on Instagram. So if you're not in that community, please do there because what we're going to try and do is for every guest speaker that we have this year, where they have a book behind them, we'll try and get a copy of that book and give it away there. So that's just at Amazing If. But the winner, the winner of uh, the book from last last week was Katie O'Driscoll so we have already communicated to Katie but just a bit of a shout out to her here and actually do you know what while we're on shout outs as well we got an amazing email this week from somebody called Alice Alice Richard who we get lots of lovely emails but Alice has really stuck out because it was basically just a hi I really like your podcast and I've got a couple of ideas for you based on some stuff that you've said and on one podcast recently we mentioned our desire to go as paperless as possible in our training programs and she had a great idea about how we can use whiteboards to do that kind of these portable mobile whiteboards and then she also talked about Sarah had in one of the podcasts mentioned her random acts of discovery and she had a link to share to help to fuel Sarah so it was just a really nice really lovely email from some who listens and has ideas for how we can make work better for everyone so yes thank you for that for all of your messages and especially to Alice and well done to Katie. Cool so let's move on to this week's topic and we're going to be talking about micromanaging and it's one of those things where whenever we run leadership courses we often start the day by asking people to share their characteristics of the best and the worst managers that they've had and I think universally without fail micromanagement comes up as the bane of people's life. People get really frustrated by it. No one enjoys being micromanaged. And I find it fascinating because I think we all recognise this and yet it still happens. And so the more I've thought about this, the more I think we all must do it at times, but not necessarily know that's what we're doing. And perhaps we don't sort of understand the impact that it's having on the people around us because otherwise most of us seem to know that it's not a good thing and yet it still seems to happen. And there was a survey done that found that four out of five employees feel that they've been micromanaged at some point. 50% of people say that if you're micromanaged, it decreases your productivity. And two out of three people feel that it decreases their morale. I don't know who that one of three people is who are going, oh, well, I'm micromanaged. My morale <laughs> <love> improves. It. <laughs> yeah, it just makes me happier. So I always find those stats kind of interesting to a point. But I think no one likes it. But we know that as part of Squiggly Careers, when probably the frequency within which we're moving jobs is increasing, different roles that we're kind of playing within organisations, whether sometimes we're leading teams or leading projects, our ability to be able to kind of manage teams in the right way with enough detail, but without kind of leaving people to kind of manage by themselves is actually a real skill. And I think it's often something that people are not really taught. You're often put in these positions where maybe suddenly you are now a manager And you're sort of thinking, okay, so what does that mean? And you have to figure a lot of this stuff out for yourself. So this week, we're going to talk about micromanagement. We're also going to talk about the flip side, which is sometimes called macromanagement or undermanagement. And that can cause just as many problems as the micromanagers. So we're going to share some of our experiences, some of the really interesting research in this area, in case that's interesting for everybody who's listening. And then our kind of top tips at the end, three top tips for dealing with a micromanager. So if you're maybe feeling like that's somebody you're working for at the moment, what can you do? And also for your own management style and when you're reflecting on how you work, what could you maybe do differently? And as always, we'll end with some resources where you can learn more, watch more, etc. So Helen, without revealing any names, I guess, um, (laughs) have you experienced micromanagement frequently? Is it something that you recognise as a problem in terms of as you progress through your career, have you worked for people who perhaps have displayed some of these tendencies? 
I do love the way that we have to share our career experiences by not sort of naming people sometimes. <laughs> if, our, if our ex-managers ever listen to this and they're like, is she talking about me? I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Um, I so know, I feel like we're like a personal glass door. You know, if the glass door is like a, um, a review of companies. It's like, if you actually listen to this podcast, you probably you could probably learn quite a lot about the people we've worked for, the organisations that we've worked in. <laughs> Oh dear, yeah, it's probably scary. So my experiences of micromanagement, I was really thinking hard about this. I was thinking who, it's not to say that I've had all brilliant managers, but actually I'm not sure that micromanagement, when I've had troubles or challenges with managers, I'm not sure it's been micromanagement that's been the primary thing. So I definitely have experienced it. And if I think about what that's meant for me, that's meant people that are being too directive about the work they want me to do so they're being very instructional in what they want me to do they're not giving me enough space to come up with my own thinking and ideas for it checking in on my work quite a lot and asking to be cc'd in on things that sort of thing so they're not uh, I guess trusting me or giving me the space to do the work in the way I think it should be done and I have experienced that in my career, but I think it's been more project specific. So rather than having a manager who does that all the time, it's been more on certain probably high profile or high pressured projects. So where they've been short of time and it's got to have been um, done to a perceived certain standard by that manager or whether the project might reflect on them in some way. I've definitely felt micromanaged in those situations. And just thinking about the research you mentioned when it was um, people feel their kind of morale gets hit by it. I've definitely felt like that. I've ended up feeling frustrated that I can't do my best work. A bit like, well, you just do it your way then because I'm basically just just, I'm basically just doing yeah, the stuff yeah. that you want me to do. So it, I think it'd be a lot quicker if you just did it yourself, but obviously not always being able to say that. I think, yeah, there's probably only you know, four or five project type situations in my career when I've felt it. I think I've been lucky that I haven't had that manager all the time. What about you? When I was thinking back, I can think of a couple of people where... I was micromanaged, but only for a specific period of time. And actually, because we were doing the podcast today, I was reflecting on it. And actually, what was consistent is it's often when I've been in new jobs and new roles, and you sort of have some empathy and appreciation for probably why why this kind of happens, is that you're new into a job, your manager doesn't know you that well. And so people's response is often to kind of stick very close to you, perhaps get more involved in things than you maybe need them to be. And there's been a couple of instances where I think probably for the first six months or so, I felt a bit micromanaged and sometimes found that, as you described, quite frustrating or would just think, you know, just just let me get on and do it. You know, let me kind of learn how to do it in my own way. I think a lot of this comes down to trust. I think fundamentally, micromanagement and actually under management all comes down to trust and the relationship that you have with whether it's you're the manager or you're the person being kind of managed And do you have to earn somebody's trust or is it just kind of automatically given? And one of the things that's really stuck with me from a programme that I did at London Business School a couple of years ago, a lady called Tammy Erickson, um, who does some really good research about work and different kind of generations within work. She said that actually your role as a manager is to be really specific and clear about what you need people to do, but you leave people alone to work out the how. And I I really like that. It just, I think that to me is a really nice definition of making sure that as a manager, you do have accountability and that you are very clear about, you know, your expectations and people's objectives, but then actually how they get to those outcomes. Everybody has personal preferences and styles, but almost as long as those outcomes are delivered, then that's where you kind of give people the freedom. Well, I was wondering as well, when you were talking then, I kind of saw a little scale in my mind where you've got like micromanagement at one end and then under management at the other. And I was wondering as a manager where you might put yourself on the scale, like your natural tendency. So I think I would probably lean towards under management if I'm honest for myself, because I sort of value freedom and don't like the detail. So I kind of probably lean there, which is not always good. But then I was wondering the people that work for you, whether they all sit on slightly different parts of the scale. Mm. So whether some people do want a bit more direction whether some people do want a bit more freedom and whether as a manager that also introduces some complexity to this because you suddenly got to really tune into how people work best and make sure that you are giving them the direction or the space that they uniquely need which then you know I think that you end up having a bit of empathy for managers then when you realize that it's not that easy to make this work for everybody 
Yeah, and I think this is where it comes down to early on within a manager and in kind of employee's relationship, actually defining how are we going to work together and actually spending time thinking about what will work best for you, what will work best for me. And I think about how rarely that happens, you know, how rarely that conversation even happens, even if it was like a half an hour conversation of going, well, how do you like to work? How do I like to work? And, you know, you imagine if you had that as quite an informal chat before you even started a job or quite early in starting a job that could probably help overcome quite a lot of maybe misunderstandings, probably help overcome quite a lot of frustrations. You'd understand kind of people's starting point. I think I'm similar. I'm often, I would say when I was reflecting on my own management style, I'm naturally more of a under manager. And that's actually driven when you look at under management and kind of the research, it tends to be driven by three things, either kind of performance management or accountability. So not sharing clear objectives, which is not the bit I worry about, but it's also a tendency to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely somebody who finds conflict hard. And they talk about in this article, which we'll link to this idea of being, you know, like the player's manager, sport analogy alert. But you know, when you've, (laughs) you've maybe been part of a team and then suddenly you become the manager of that team. I think often when you first become a manager, there's a real risk of micromanagement because actually suddenly your relationship to your peers has changed and you're trying to get used to that. And probably most people come from a desire of wanting to be liked. And so do you become kind of overly protective of your team? You know, you're not objective enough about their performance. And actually that it gives an example in this article of actually people who under manage are often really well liked they're really collaborative they have really good relationships with their teams but often those teams don't actually perform that well in terms of outcomes either because you don't deal with the difficult stuff because you don't like conflict or because you're not setting clear objectives you're not kind of managing performance where performance is not where it needs to be so I, I wonder I think this is also fascinating in terms of at different stages in your managerial career almost are you more likely to micromanage at some points than you are others? And actually, as you become more experienced, does that help you to kind of have the confidence to say, actually, no, it's okay to delegate. It's okay not to be involved in all the detail. And actually, does a bit of experience help you to know when you need to dive in and when to kind of take a step back? I think it's such a good article. It's definitely well worth a read. Um, We'll put that in our resources. Another thing that I found that I really liked on this topic was a TED Talk. And it's quite a funny TED Talk. I would never normally describe TED Talks as funny, uh, but it's called Confessions of a Micromanager. And it's by an entrepreneur called Che Huang. And he just talks about how he basically built this business, um, which is like a, a packing and distribution business. And he talks about how he built the business and how as a business scale, which I think is similar to what Sarah was talking about is as your career gets bigger you go from being the person in his example the person that's packing the boxes to the person that's managing the people packing the boxes to the person that's managing the people managing the people packing the boxes and you still want all that like degree of control that you had when you were doing the job itself and that can be quite difficult and he just tells a very funny story about how that affected his business and how when he gave people space that sometimes they did amazing things and that actually sometimes when you gave people space things went wrong but actually that the things that went well were more significant and positive than the things that went wrong if that makes sense so he wasn't trying to create some kind of ideal view of if you just give everyone loads of freedom and you don't you micromanage them everymore everything's perfect every day but he was saying that the benefits of doing that outweighed some of the challenges that came from it and I really liked There's a study that he references that was done in the UK in the National Health Service in the NHS, which was where they followed, um, I think it was 100 healthcare specialists, so doctors, nurses, um, different people in the profession, and they tracked how they were feeling throughout the day and they tracked their emotions. And at the end of the period of the study, what they found was that the people that felt most tired or most uh, fatigued and stressed were the people that had felt micromanaged. And so the research basically showed that micromanagement can lead to people being more fatigued fatigued as well as some of the other things that um, Sarah talked about before. One other thing that I thought was quite interesting in, in the research that I found, again, we'll, we'll share all the links with you, was about um, micromanagement can often spread in a culture. And I think I have mm. seen this. So where a senior person's maybe a micromanager, it then cascades down to the person who works for them and the people that work for them because it almost creates this um, lack of trust, a bit of a fear, high control culture. And I think that's the bit that I kind of think is quite scary if you see this particularly in senior people the impact it can have on the wider organization
so let's go on to top tips then. So maybe if I talk through, if you are a micromanager, I think well done for uh, uh, sort of being honest if that's how you are. Um, but a couple of tips that can help you. And then Sarah will go on to the tips for if you feel like you're being micromanaged, what can you do to maybe be in control of this a little bit more? So starting with you as a micromanager then, the first thing is, You've got to think about how you can increase the level of trust that you have with the people that work for you. And that means giving them some space, some space to do even better work than you might think you can do yourself. And also maybe some space to fail and accepting that that might happen. I think do this in small steps. Okay, so don't suddenly give them a really big, high profile project and totally back off if that's something you've never done before but think about what are all the checks that you're putting in place at the moment on those types of projects and how can you maybe halve it so you're not going completely extreme because that's going to feel inconsistent to them and a bit weird to you but actually just think about how could I get a bit better at this what are some of the controls that I've put in place at the moment that I could maybe take off so that this feels like they have more freedom and space and maybe even talk to people about it a big part of creating psychological safety in teams might be saying to your people that are working for you I recognize that I have been micromanaging in these situations one of the things that I'm working on is getting better at that and this is how I'm going to do it and that links to point number two which is getting feedback. So if you identify as a micromanager, get some feedback from your team, thinking about what more could you do to help them in their role. That's such a positive question to ask them. And that might help you to focus on something positive that you could do and control rather than something limiting, which is what you're likely to be doing if you're operating as a micromanager at the moment. And tip number three is to prioritise the things that you really do need to get involved in. So as we talked about, this is not just about going straight to being a a person who's completely hands off and not getting involved. There are likely to be some things that are still very valuable for you to get involved in, but it's not everything. So maybe you prioritise the things that you think that you need to get involved with and then sense check that with your team back in towards the conversation of this is something I'm working on at the moment you could say these are the five things that I think I really need to get involved in and this is what my involvement look like from my perspective what do you think although I think the overarching thing here is well done for recognizing it start to have a conversation with your team prioritize with them get feedback and just start doing this and I think one of the other things to reflect on is do you actually know what your style of management is? So we've we've probably talked before on this podcast about the difference between intent and impact. And I think often if you think about how common it is that people say that they are being micromanaged in some way, shape or form, the likelihood is, I think, that there is lots of unconscious micromanagement happening. And so you might not even know whether you're a micromanager or not. You might not be able to kind of self-identify. You might think, well, hopefully I'm not, but I'm not really sure. So the first step could actually just be talking to the people that you work with, whether that's a team that you manage or a, a project that you're managing. And you don't need to kind of go, am I a micromanager or not? But you can just ask really simple questions like, do you feel like I'm getting involved enough to help you on this project? Or actually, do you think I'm getting too involved? Do you feel confident to sort of go off and and run this by yourself? And just asking people those kind of questions which feel supportive gives people the opportunity to give you that feedback so that you can kind of work out that point around, are you giving people enough support without it being too much? And also recognising that the answer to that question is likely to look different for different people. Yeah, and this is why it's really hard to be a manager, isn't it? You know, like the responsibility of being a manager is a really big one. You know, the amount of things that you're expected to do in terms of both often doing some sort of day job as well as kind of managing as part of this day job is often why you get into some of these behaviours or fall into some of these behaviours. I think often you're just not aware of it. So if you're kind of not sure or if you just don't have that awareness, also think about what you could do. And so if you're one of those people thinking, oh, I'm being micromanaged at the moment, three top tips as to what you could do to sort of maybe start shifting this. I think the first tip is to take accountability rather than blaming. We've talked today about how easy it is probably for people to micromanage, how often people are doing it, maybe without realising, almost giving people the benefit of the doubt. If you were kind of going rather than just blaming the other person, which I think is obviously what we all do because we all get a bit frustrated and we're like, oh, (laughs) yeah, it's all their fault. It's nothing to do with me. Actually, maybe asking your manager, what can you do to make sure that they have what they need? 
and having that two-way feedback conversation about how you're going to work together and it doesn't matter whether you've worked with someone for a year or a month but just almost a conversation that focuses on okay let's agree what our shared objectives are or you know you you might talk about this is what I think my objectives are for this month or for the next three months to talk to me about how involved you want to be with each of these things what would you like to see and actually I think I did do this a couple of times with managers who I spotted I felt like they were very much kind of in the detail of what I was doing and actually by having these conversations I then understood better oh okay so in a one-to-one conversation they want me to bring these three things or actually if weekly I sent this update that's actually really what they need and so I could then almost start to, for myself, take the actions that I knew would help me and kind of help my manager. So that's kind of tip number one, take accountability rather than blaming. Tip number two is almost trying to walk in the shoes, I guess, of your manager. So having some empathy with the challenges that probably they're facing. I suspect a lot of micromanagement comes from, as Helen talked about um, in some of her examples, people being under a lot of pressure, under a lot of stress, And then that kind of drives often kind of the wrong behaviours. So if you can walk in their shoes, if you can recognise that, think about how can you help them? How could you actually help your manager overcome some of those challenges? How could you help them reduce that stress? Are there better solutions for some of the things that you're doing that would actually mean it makes kind of life easier for everyone? And sometimes even just saying to your manager, is there anything else I could do to help you? You know, is there anything I could do differently that would help you? Because I appreciate these things this meeting is particularly stressful or these things, it's a particularly stressful time because everyone's under a bit of pressure. Sometimes just acknowledging that you understand the context that people are operating in can again mean that you come up with some solutions together that I guess accept that you you understand why the behaviour is happening. It doesn't mean it's the right behaviour, but it does show a bit of kind of empathy, which I think can be really helpful. And then the third point, which is really just all around trust. So If you can have the, I guess, emotional intelligence and self-awareness to spot when are the particular moments where there are issues or are there certain triggers that mean that micromanagement happens? Because I I Mm -hmm. do think it's very rare that somebody is like this all of the time, day in, day out. I think usually it's more of a something prompts these things to happen. So can you figure out what it is that prompts the micromanagement to kick in And can you be smart? Can you get ahead of it? Or actually, is it easier to accept? You know, if it's occasional, if it's, you know, very occasionally once a month or every couple of months, you do find that, you know, your managers may be delving in a bit more than you think they probably need to. If you understand what's triggered that, you might just go, oh, I get it. I understand what it is that's making this happen. And actually, that means that sometimes you just feel less frustrated. You can feel a bit more positive about it because you've understood So I think when you are being kind of micromanaged, don't focus on trying to kind of change the other person, which I know can feel a bit frustrating because you think, well, that's kind of what needs to happen. And absolutely it is. And that's what the first set of top tips were for. But I think if you start to worry too much about changing someone else, often a lot of that stuff is out of your control. So think about what is in your control. What can you do? What can you proactively do that might help just reduce the level of micromanagement might mean that it's occasional rather than more consistent. At some points, if you do have somebody who is doing it consistently, you feel like you've taken lots of action and still nothing is changing. You've kind of got two choices. I guess you've got the, are you confident enough to give somebody feedback about the impact that it's having on your work? And sometimes if people understand that, that does help people to change their behaviour. So if you can kind of say, when you you behave in this way, this is how it kind of makes me feel and this is the impact on my work if a manager is really focused on getting results you know that can help people to go oh okay well we all want to get great results so that might help change people's behavior or sometimes it doesn't and then that's the point we kind of have to go does this feel like an environment where I'm getting to do my best work and and do the right things but I think those kind of more dramatic scenarios where it's really kind of stifling your growth are hopefully more few and far between so I'm sure we all have them at some point in our careers and it's just going how long can you last what can you do and then sometimes it can be what what do you want to do next what I really like about the uh, crux of the tips which I think if I summarized it would be if you're a micromanager 
learn to trust. And if you're being micromanaged, think about how you can use empathy to help. If I think about those two particular skills of trust and empathy, I think that they are such powerful skills. And sometimes when we do our um, super strengths training, people will identify that they've got these skills, they've got high trust, or they've got high empathy. And they'll say, Oh, but why is that valuable? Is Everybody's got that. That's not surely that's not going to help me in my career. And then you kind of do this podcast. And you're like, well, that's at the crux of these really effective relationships. Those if you think that you're doing that already if you're a high empathy person or you're already working with high levels of trust as a manager don't undermine how powerful those are as strengths that you have and the positive impact that they'll be having on other people because they're really at the core of these this particular situation that we're talking about in terms of being an effective manager and having an effective relationship with your manager Mm. So hopefully that has been some help for you if you are in that situation at the moment or, or you know, you're potentially, what was it, four out of five of us feel like we've been micromanaged, so you might be in the future. So uh, save this one for future listening, maybe. And if you'd like to get hold of any of the resources, we've got quite a few different articles. We've got the results of that survey that we've referenced, the TED Talk. It will all be on amazingif.com. If you just head to the blog, the new website's in development. So in the future, if you're listening to this in the future, it will be on the podcast section. But um, right now, it's um, <laughs> as we're recording. I know, it's very odd. Right now, it's on, it's on the blog. You'll find it basically on the website, but you'll get all those articles there and you'll, we'll also put the summary of the top three tips for both of those things that we talked about. Thank you to everybody who takes the time to share the podcast uh, with people. We hear that quite a lot and it makes us very happy because I think it's probably one of the best ways that we can reach other people is when you're recommending us to people that you know. So thank you to that. Also, another really important way for us to reach people is through um, reviews, which happen on iTunes podcast. We're actually, I was looking at this, Sarah, we're actually at 93 reviews at the moment and they're all five star, which is very kind. Um, So if you would... that's nice. Though I don't don't like that as a number. (laughs) It's like, it needs to be 100. Oh, okay. (laughs) You want to hunt? Okay. I right, like, so I like for round the sake numbers. of uh, <laughs> seven, the please. Sake of seven seven sanity, people. Please review us. <laughs> could seven people please leave us a review on the uh, on, on iTunes? Please? That'd be amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, it does actually help us. All those reviews really help us with algorithms. So it helps us to show up and means for us, it isn't just about getting to a round number. It is genuinely about the more people that we can help <laughs> with our podcast. It fits our purpose and mission of helping everyone to be better at work. So yeah, if you can support that as well as the desire to have round numbers, that would be amazing. Amazing. So next week, we're going to be talking about goal setting. I think it's particularly was prime in people's mind in January, but it's more of a not just using this as a, a, a new year, new goals, but actually how you create really effective goals, how you stick to them, how you share them with other people so you're more likely to be committed. So we'll be pulling together all of our experiences, lots of research and giving you some actionable tips in terms of goal setting next week. And if you ever have any ideas for us for future podcasts or just thoughts or stuff you want to share, like the lovely Alice about ideas for how we could do what we do better, please get in touch with us. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can email us. Our email address is just get in touch at amazingif.com. There's Instagram that we mentioned, which is where we do our daily squiggly careers tip over there. That's just at amazingif. And then on Twitter, we're at amazing underscore if. We share lots of articles there. Or you can just connect with either myself or Sarah Helen Tupper or Sarah Ellis on LinkedIn. So lots of different places you can find us should you wish to post podcast. And we'll leave it there for this week and we'll speak to you again next week, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.